Okay, hello everyone. I would like to welcome you on our first of the series of webinars based around reaction colorimetry. My name is Vit Prekal. I work with a UK-based company, Sirius, and we make a lot of chemical, chemical devices. So, uh, just to keep the introduction short, I will firstly talk a little bit about Sirius because some of you may not be familiar with us. So, what do we do? And then we will move on to the main topic, which is the reaction colorimetry. So Sirius, uh, we actually uh, are a fairly old company in the business. We, are, uh, we uh, celebrated 17 years on the market. We were founded in 2001 to address the challenges faced by pharmaceutical industry, which were mostly at the time uh, availability of the flow chemistry or continuous processing uh, systems. So we are actually the longest established flow chemistry company on the market. And you can find our equipment, not only flow chemistry, but even batch chemistry reactors all over the world. We actually have a global reach on markets. We are headquartered in the UK, uh, in Royston near Cambridge. We have around 125 people working on site and we have offices all around the world. As I said, we have offices in the United States, Japan, India, and newly opened one in Southeast Asia in Vietnam. And we have a quite extensive uh, network of distributors as well. Sirius itself is a part of the Black Trace group, so we actually focus on more fields. So we have a few sister brands. I will keep this very short. If you're very interested, please have a look at our website and you can find more information. So just to keep it short, uh, Dolomite is a sister brand focusing mostly on a, and only on microfluidic products, glass solutions. We have our own glass work, so all the glass work you actually see is produced in-house. We have Particle Works, who is basically uh, few scientists who actually work on engineering nanoparticles uh, as they are needed by customers. And we have Dolomite Bio, which is a specific biology use of a microfluidics for single cell research. So to get uh, what we will cover in next 40, 45 minutes. So I did the introduction. We'll actually talk a little bit about process safety fundamentals. Uh, we'll talk about colorimetry in general and the challenges of heat measurement. Then we will focus more on a reaction colorimetry, its first principles and overview, what data can it provide and how it can help us. We'll, sh we'll talk shortly about a few examples, how it can be helpful, sum everything up, and we'll have a time for your questions in the end of the session. So I would like to point out, this is meant as an introductory uh, session uh, to basically give people idea where the colorimetry and the reaction colorimetry actually fits in a process safety and process development. So some of you who are more uh, experienced in a subject may find it a little bit uh, a little bit too general, but we need to make sure that all our attendees actually have a good understanding before we move in other webinars into more detailed subjects. So we will have a quick poll shown. Please, if you can spend 30 seconds, what level of experience with colorimetry or process development do you have? Okay, so we have the results in. So uh, we have a mostly that people have read about the subject. So hopefully this session will be very informative for you. And it's actually a very good indication for future webinars, how much you focus. So let's get into the topic. So first of all, I want to start about the fundamentals of process development and the safety of chemical reactions. Because the process development and process safety is very, very broad and a very detailed subjects with lots of legis legislation and a lot of things. We could actually spend a few hours talking about it. So we will actually simplify it down, not to get overwhelmed with too much information and focus solely on the safety of the chemical reactions. Because in the end, the whole process safety is a big cooperation of uh, not only scientists in the lab and chemical engineers in a plant, but also management public relations with the local communities, all of this actually needs to be taken into account and this is literally out of our scope. So we can actually quite easily simplify the process development into five steps. It's very simplified, but it will actually perfectly demonstrate what we need to focus on. So yeah, as I said, five steps. First, we need to make sure that we, want, we know what we actually want to produce. Uh, the second step is, we need to figure out how we actually gonna make the product. The next step would be to make sure that we can actually create a product on a small scale 
as efficiently and as safely as possible. Afterwards, when we're happy, we can move on to scale up the production. So we would move to so-called kilo lab or pilot plant, which would be a small uh, proof of concept production of our chemical. And the last step, obviously, is the production. So we would probably have a specialized production line creating big batches of the product. So uh, we can actually maximize uh, everything which we really strive for. But so we simplify the five simple steps, but there are quite few challenges, including in each of the steps. So what kind of questions can we actually ask? So the first one is really straightforward. What do we want to produce? So when we know the answer, we'll probably uh, get the idea to the chemists who will have to figure out the synthesis path of the desired product. So uh, they will basically design the process, usually which will be multi-step a multi-step process of several uh, reactions. We need to figure out what are the properties of the materials used. Are they stable? Are they safe to use? Uh, and we also need to figure out what are the kinetics of the process to make sure we can actually utilize, utilize, uh, utilize the process to run as efficiently as possible. In the next step, in optimization, basically we optimize the synthetic route that was given to us. So how can we run the process efficiently and safely? We can determine what are the process control parameters. So how can we actually make sure that we are in control over a different, uh, all the different aspects of uh, chemical production? And we can actually optimize temperature ramps, uh, work of times, dosing profiles, all those important things which actually make sure that our process is good. When we are happy, we can then move to the pilot, uh, pilot kilo lab or, uh, or pilot, pilot plant. So the main questions there are a little bit different because the optimization has been done. We basically need to confirm that we can actually, in a, in a, in a stepwise, increase the scale of production and still keep very high safety margins. And if we are able to actually keep control of the process at higher scale, which can be a very, very challenging uh, thing. We will actually touch on that a little bit later. And of course, during the scaling up, we also need to look on a failure scenarios. So are we able to minimize risk if something goes wrong? And at, in production, quite different challenges actually need to be addressed. So we need to define standard operation procedures. So actually the technicians who are operating the plant know what to do routinely and know what to do if something happens. We need to note all the changes to the process and obviously have a quality control. So we can actually, we can actually make sure that we are producing what we want and with the yields we are actually striving for. So it looks like a fairly straightforward process, but it's a little bit more complicated. So if we actually look at the development timeline, we actually added a few things because it's really a continuous process because rarely the steps synthesis optimization will happen that we have a first synthetic route which is efficient enough and safe enough to do. So usually from the optimization step, the, the workflow would return back to synthesis to find a different, for example, more efficient or more safer way to create uh, our product. Uh, or if we found out we have some reactive intermediates which could be potentially dangerous, we need to find out a different way how to create things. On the, uh, so I put a little divide in the middle because that it's, a, it's not as a rule of thumb because it depends on the size of a company. So usually the first three steps will be done by chemists, the optimizations that will be a mix of chemists and chemical engineers, whether the scaling up and production will usually uh, be handled by chemical engineers. But depending on the size of a site, it can be one person or it can be actually quite few departments working in close cooperation. And as you can see from the production, we can actually return back to optimization. So if we on a production scale actually find out, okay, the yields, we are not really satisfied with them. We can actually return to optimization. For example, if you have a catalytic reactions, find a different kind of catalyst and re-optimize the process. Even if it's been running for years safely, we can actually make sure that we are getting as best results while keeping a high safety margin still. So what is the history? It's I think an important aspect to have a look at. So the process safety itself is a lot, lot older because I think the first uh, 
kind of a com uh, comprehensive uh, process safety program was uh, introduced in DuPont, uh, DuPont uh, Gunpowder Works in 1802. But on a strictly chemical way, one of the best examples is actually uh, production of the nitroglycerin by Alfred Nobel. So we have actually a nice illustration uh, of an operator sitting next to the reactor vessel. And the point was a very large scale production of nitroglycerin because Alfred Nobel, as everybody knows, invented the dynamite and he needed a reliable source of nitroglycerin to uh, manufacture the explosive. And the synthesis of nitroglycerin on its own is quite dangerous process by its nature. And especially if we took into account in 1860s, because it's done by mixing fuming nitric acid and sulfuric acid with, uh, with glycerine at fairly constant temperature of 25 degrees. The problem is those uh, additions are very exothermic. So basically the operator sitting next to the vessel was operating valves to make sure uh, the temperature wouldn't go over the margin of 25 degrees. So, and you can actually see on a picture one of the first safety implementations, because if you look at the operator, he's sitting on a one leg stool, because as you can imagine, watching a thermometer all day long while uh, operating the valves isn't really the most enjoyable thing to do. If the operator would actually doze off, he would fall off the chair, keeping him awake and still make sure that if something goes wrong, he would actually still have a time to escape. So that was kind of a first level fail safe. There was also a catastrophic scenario fail safe because the reactor vessels were designed in a way if the onset of the decomposition or thermal runaway was reached, the operator could Shut down the shut down the dosing feeds and dump the reactor tank into the drone out tank, neutralizing the the regions, giving him enough time to actually run away and minimize the risk to the property, the operator, and the surrounding uh, community. So it's really the process safety is about understanding the thermochemical data. So if we actually move into more recent things, what can go wrong? So we have a two illust uh, uh, just illustration photos here because we won't talk about those accidents in detail. But the one on the left is Opal, now Ludwigshafen, a uh, very huge explosion of nit uh, ammonium nit uh, nitrate in 1921, which was probably one of the biggest chemical plant uh, explosions uh, to date, really, because I believe the fatality rate was about 500, uh, massive uh, property and everything. The thing, interesting thing about this uh, accident is uh, that they actually use dynamite to break down the pile of the ammonium nitrate, which, to be honest, in today's understanding, could be seen as a quite dangerous thing to do. The other picture is from Flexbro from UK, uh, from 1974. And there was, again, quite a big misunderstanding of the thermochemical properties uh, of the production uh, site. I think this was actually a production of cyclohexane in, uh, in a cascade of batch reactors. But they found out that one of the vessels actually wasn't up to the job. So they bypassed it with a piping of different size than it was actually designed for, leading to region accumulation and actually resulting in very big explosion. But those incidents actually happened before we actually had a means to determine the critical safety factors. It was way before the reaction colorimeters were available commercially. But we will look at the fairly recent incident in Jacksonville, Florida, which happened in 2007, so just 11 years ago. So it was a very, very big explosion caused by the thermal uh, runaway because of the cooling failure of the reactor. So they were producing uh, a dye, which is used in a petrol industry, which was a batch process. So the reactor itself was two and a half thousand uh, gallon production scale reactor. And the reaction was initiated by heating up, uh, heating up uh, the mixture up to 100 degrees. So uh, one of the regions, the sodium metal, would liquefy, and the heating was then controlled up to 150 degrees, where the heating was shut down because the reaction itself actually produced enough heat to be self-sustaining, and only cooling, uh, only, only a cooling water would be injected into the jacket in an evaporative cooling to make sure everything is under control. But what happened at when the reactor, it was manually controlled. It's an important thing to say as well. 
At 182 degrees, the operator decided that the temperature is a little bit too high, and he tried to commence the cooling. However, the cooling failed. So what was the result? After 10 minutes, the ongoing decomposition reaction in a reactor actually increased the pressure and uh, the temperature beyond any limit. So actually, the burst disk and the pressure relief device actually opened, but it wasn't designed for such a flows through it. And the witnesses actually actually said there was a jet engine-like sound for a few minutes before a huge explosion was heard. And the investigation afterwards actually uh, estimate that the explosion yield was three quarters of a ton of uh, TNT. So what were the causes? So usually these kind of uh, incidents have a, have a kind of a cascade of the problems. The main problem here was a misunderstanding of the thermo, uh, of the thermochemistry behind the process. Because if you recall the diagram of process development, we had a look, they basically skipped from uh, one liter, basically figuring the synthetic way reactor all the way to, to two and a half thousand gallon reactor to save costs. Another thing that needs to be taken into account is was a rather poor reaction vessel design. It was rather simple and it had too many single point failures, especially on a cooling system, which failed. So afterwards it failed. They had no way how to actually make sure that uh, the system can be controlled again. Another thing was inadequate reactor pressure venting. So they, it had a burst disk and it would probably would be able to vent the pressure and nothing would happen but it was set up for too high pressure. So actually the pressure and temperature increased so much that when it burst, it wasn't able to vent all the overpressure out, leading to explosion. So the fundament, poor understanding of the thermochemistry, because they did some preliminary screening studies and they calculated what should happen, but the secondary reaction or the decomposition of the thermal runaway was way more energetic than they have anticipated and actually tested for. So what was the aftermath? So for their people on site, uh, including the plant owner and the chief engineer who are trying to keep the process under control. 32 people injured in a near vicinity of the, uh, of the site and massive damages to the property around the plant. And the conclusion was that American Institute of Chemical Engineers actually introduced mandatory reactive hazard awareness courses to chemical curriculum at universities because it was found out it usually just mentioned, but no uh, no uh, deeper understanding is really required. So if you look at the pictures here, so the left picture actually shows the agitator shaft of the reactor, which was found, I believe, three miles away from the site, embedded in a sidewalk, concrete sidewalk. And on the right picture, we can actually see uh, the remnants of the ruptured vessel. So you can actually imagine what it probably would be like. So if you look at it like this, why is it important to perform colorimetric studies and understand the kinetics and the thermochemistry behind our process? So, yeah, we need to understand the kinetics to make sure we know what part of the reaction is actually taking part. We can actually make sure that the process can be run safely under most of the circumstances. And if it can't be guaranteed, we can actually figure out the standard operating procedures and uh, emergency systems to make sure we can control and minimize the risks if some failure would occur. We can actually optimize the processes that are already run on production scale. So to optimize yields, uh, we have a new, for example, we could have a new supply of catalyst. So we can actually figure out if it's going to be better or not. And we can even use it to understand the non-reaction side of the processes. So safe storages, shelf life, and many, many different, uh, different aspects we can use it for. So next section, calorimetry overview in general. There are a few challenges that we actually uh, need to address. And the first and a major one for calorimetry and thermochemistry, really, is the heat measurement. So there are five major facts about heat or energy that we need to take into account. So we cannot directly measure heat. We just, there isn't a device that would basically would stick into something and tell you what is the energy actually stored inside because it's a function of the internal energy. We can only measure its uh, its difference over time or, or, or temperature gradients. Also, we cannot contain the heat because it will always try to equilibrate with its uh, surroundings. 
if you have some heat losses, they will be usually localized depending on the heat transfer properties. And the most challenging part is the heat transfer may actually change over time. So, for example, if you take into account of the chemical reactor, if our product will change composition, the heat transfer properties will change. So if you look at a picture on the left, we have an IR picture of a house, and you can actually see where the heat losses are occurring. And this kind of a principle, because you may say, oh, it's very challenging. We can actually use those five facts to actually measure heat quite accurately because we can direct the heat in a path uh, we, can actually measure, we can actually measure. So that's a function of most of the reaction calorimeters and calorimeters alike. So we have different calorimetry solutions and we will talk about them in a moment. But a very important fact now is to have a look in the history because people usually don't really realize how important calorimetry was for the development of modern understanding of chemistry and thermodynamics. So the foundations, believe it or not, were actually uh, put, uh, were actually devised in the middle of 18th century by Scottish physicist Joseph Black, who is considered the founder of calorimetry because he was the first one to recognize the difference between, difference between heat and the temperature, which at the time was a quite an undertaking. But he did most of the theoretical work and he had no means to confirm his hypothesis, which was done by a very famous French chemist, uh, Antoine Lavoisier, who is often considered the father of the modern chemistry, because he built with his not very, uh, with his quite famous colleague, Pierre uh, Simon Laplace, the first device to measure heat or measure heat transfer, the calorimeter, which comes from Latin, calor, the heat, and Greek, matron, which is to measure. And he based the design around the calculations and discoveries of Joseph Black. And the device allowed for measurements of heat involved in various chemical changes. So basically he had a, it works like the typical ice uh, styrofoam calorimeter most of us, uh, most of us actually used in school. So he had a, a container filled with ice. He had a chemical reaction going around it. And by amount of ice that actually melted, he was able to quantify the amount of energy uh, that was involved in a change. And the interesting fact is that first experiment he did, he actually used the heat from guinea pig's respiration to melt snow uh, in his apparatus, showing that the respiratory exchange is actually oxidation combustion similar to candle burning, which was a breakthrough at the time at 1780. And basically those experiments are very important in a field of thermodynamics and modern understanding of chemistry because it laid the foundations for formulation of the first law of, law of thermodynamics later in the 19th century. So, but if you are a little bit familiar with the calorimetry or calorimeters, they're actually quite few different types. And if you are talking about process development and safety, not all are actually used. So I prepared a quick overview of a different calorimeters that are available. That's obviously not all of them, but there are four major groups. So we have a bomb calorimeters, micro calorimeters, adiabatic calorimeters, and reaction calorimeters. So the first one, the bomb calorimeters are still basically using the similar principle as Lavoisier used in his calorimeter in 1782. They are used mainly for the determination of heat of combustion. So we would, loot, uh, we would load the bomb, which is usually a stainless steel vessel able to withstand high pressures and high temperatures. And we would ignite the sample inside. It would heat up the vessel, which in turn would heat up the water, measuring the difference between temperature, knowing all the parameters and heat capacities. We can actually quantify the energy of the combustion usually used, for example, for energy density of a coal in power plants. But that kind of a calorimeter isn't usually used in a process development. The other three are used very frequently and usually together. So we have a microcalorimeters. Uh, they are also called a differential scanning calorimeters. They are very simple and very effective technique to assess stability and properties of substances, such as uh, their heat capacity, their melting points, uh, the energy needs for melting, and the composition. And they are very quick to be used. Then we have adiabatic calorimeters, which are used to assess the composition and undesired reactions. So basically, they are used to assess the situation when a failure would occur, so thermal runaways and failure of cooling, 
similar things like that. And finally, we have reaction colorimeters. So we actually have an example here, which is our Ceres Atlas uh, colorimeter, which is basically used to simulate the plant conditions as best as possible. So, and it's basically a jacketed reactor that will allow us uh, on a small scale simulate what will be happening in a big production scale uh, with provisions to give us uh, the heat transfer measurements and everything. So we will touch on those a lot further, a little bit further in the session. So the first group, the micro colorimeters or differential scanning colorimeters, they are very simple devices. Uh, we have two crucibles, one loaded with sample, the other one is blank, and they are, and basically we will heat up linearly both crucibles and basically measure the heat generated uh, in, inside of the, of the crucibles. And it's differential because we are actually comparing the blank one with the, with the sample one. And it's ideal tool for preliminary screening studies because we require a very small amount of the sample. Usually it's micrograms. The experiments are very fast and what, what, it, what data can it give us? So it's usually quanti uh, quantitative energy data. So we have a, with a small data, small sample, it's very quick to perform, and we can actually uh, get information that we can actually uh, predict the behaviors of compounds and mixtures at higher temperatures. But it has its limitations. Since we, the crucibles are very small, the samples cannot be stirred. Uh, there are usually uh, no pressure monitoring uh, available, and we are not able to dose into, into the crucibles as well. And the typical thermogram you can actually see uh, on the right side of your screen. So we have actually two events uh, on the example. So the left one is actually endothermic effect of melting of the solid substance in a sample crucible. And the peak on the right, the broad peak, is actually onset and actual decomposition of the sample. So you can see this is the kind of a data we are able uh, to do with a differential scanning colorimetry, but it lacks all the inf all necessary information to do the proper safety studies. So that's why I mentioned we need all of those three, combina uh, the combination of the three to get a comprehensive information. So this, the another group are the abatic colorimeters, which are very important in process development. They are specialized instruments allowing assessing the most dangerous scenarios. Uh, it works on adiabatic principle. So basically, if you have an exothermic event inside of the uh, reactor vessel, it will work on a principle that all the heat that is generated by the is generated by the reaction is actually contained, which will result in a temperature increase. And those devices are usually very pressure, uh, very pressure resistant, and can actually handle a rather rather big temperature ramps. So they are usually able to cope with very high temperature changes. Up to actually, there are examples in a world that can actually heat up with the ramps of up to 200,000 degrees per minute and can handle pressures. So they are ideal tool for investigating the chemical or thermal runaways of the processes. So, and because the sample volume is bigger, it's in a scale of milliliters, we can actually make sure that we can actually stir the samples of needed. We actually get a pressure data as well but usually the experiments are longer than the DSC, so it's a good complementary thing. And if you look at the mode of operation, so the typical mode of operation of adiabatic calorimeter is a heat, weight, and search. So it will work, if you look at a the thermogram, in a staircase kind of a way, where it will heat up by a given amount, wait for a given time at isothermal conditions, and then search to basically search for any changes in the temperature. If it doesn't fit in the margin, it will continue into next step, until it can detect there is some thermal event happening in a crucible, then it will switch to adiabatic mode and record the whole uh, heat release during the decomposition in a vessel. And the last group, uh, very important in the process design, are the reaction colorimeters. So those are devices to simulate the plant operation as closely as possible on a small scale to make sure that we can actually control uh, control the process on a small scale quite easily, often used with uh, processes that we are not really sure how they will perform. So they are designed to allow control addition of reactants, uh, 
different stereo geometries to make sure to match as closely as possible the production scale. They will usually have a higher volumes compared to the screening methods, the DSC or the adiabatic colorimeters, usually from 250 milliliters up to two liters. They have provisions uh, for capturing the thermal data. So if you think about it, it's not really usable for safety studies, but we can actually optim uh, we can actually find the kinetics, different uh, reaction paths, and we can actually it will allow us to further optimize the process to run as efficiently as possible. And reaction colorimeters are generally used to investigate a desired reaction, so the process we actually want to follow, which will create our product. Uh, in comparison with uh, microcalorimeters or adiabatic ones, which are mostly used for undesired uh, reactions or just the screening studies. So those are the main types of calorimeters. So if we go back to our schematic, where do they fit? So I actually removed the production scale because we wouldn't use calorimetry on a production scale. So during the first three phases, we would use the screen methods, screening methods as the DSC, really to identify uh, the physical uh, properties of our compounds, regions, their heat capacity, uh, their decomposition temperature, and basically their behavior at higher temperatures. During the synthesis and optimization, we can actually start using reaction colorimetry. So we can scale up our process uh, to the scale of up to two liters and actually start uh, mimicking the mimicking the production plan. So we can have a controlled dosing, controlled stirring and everything. And usually we can optimize, we will optimize several times. And when we are actually starting to be happy with our process, we can actually take uh, the adiabatic calorimetry in the process as well, which basically we can study the process we are optimizing, how it will perform at the, at the extreme. So during the thermal runaways, during the cooling failures, during the stirring failures. So let us focus on the reaction colorimetry now and what is its place in the process development which we just shown. Because it's compared to colorimetry, it's a fairly new method because the first commercial availability of uh, reaction colorimetry was, I believe, in 1986. But the introduction of such systems allowed for stage process development. So the stepwise approach that I showed on previous slides and as the process grows in a scale, we can still keep pace with it and make sure everything will be under control. And using colorimeters, we don't are not really restricted to this. We can actually even predict what will happen if we have enough data. And as I mentioned before, we can actually use it for processes we are quite happy with to improve them even further. So let us look at a slight hist quick history on a reaction colorimetry. So what it actually is. So the first, an original idea came from Switzerland, from Willy Regenas in 1970s, and which wasn't originally for safety studies because he basically created a jacketed reactive device, which was used for determination of thermal efficiency of the chemical reactions so to quantify the heat of reaction and the enthalpy. But it found a way very quickly into safety studies and the process development. So there are two really important rules that we need to follow. So the first general rule is we want to work in a small scale. So as I mentioned, up to two liters. It's very important because at a small scale, we are able to handle, for example, extreme exotherms very, very easily because the surface to volume ratio, for example, on this vessel and for example, 50 or 100 liter vessel, is very different and it's very hard to control uh, bigger size processes. So this is basically can be used as a kind of a playground for the chemists to make sure they understand what is happening and what are the, what is the energy profile of our reaction. And the second important thing under realistic process conditions. So we will try to actually match the vessel geometry, the steering geometry, the steering speed, the dosing ramps with the actual design process. So we can actually simulate it on a sale, uh, safe side to make sure nothing will happen. So what are the topics in reaction colorimetry? What we will cover? Some applications and uh, different methods, how we can actually measure heat in chemical reactors. When it should be performed, what data can we get from a typical reaction colorimetry experiments? 
and interpretation of data. So examples, uh, how reaction colorimetry can actually help you, even though, uh, for example, re-optimization of the process uh, using a, using a examples using a reduction uh, reduction agents. So the applications. This is really just a general overview because obviously there are quite few things that can be done even though they are set, set here differently. So mostly they are used for semi-batch reactions. So difference between batch reactions and semi-batch, batch reaction is that we actually dose all the regions inside of the vessel and usually the process is initiated by raising the temperature or adding a catalyst, which can be quite challenging uh, because of the principles how typical reaction colorimetry, colorimeters work. But there are devices such as the chemisense colorimeter you can see on a picture, uh, and we have the reactor here actually, which can actually handle pure batch reactions and even continuous flow reactions, so there have been papers uh, published regarding this. Another prerequisite, prerequisite is that we are really limited to mo mobile media only, so liquid ones. Usually working with solids only or highly viscous media can be very difficult to assess. It always also comes down, uh, oh, I just skipped, I'm sorry. It also comes down uh, to the measuring principles which you'll touch on the next slide. And as we are trying to actually make sure that we are mimicking the production line, uh, the production will usually run under reflux, conduct, uh, reflux uh, conditions. So we can maximize the efficiency uh, so higher temperature means faster reactions, faster reactions mean, means more product, means uh, management's happy. And obviously we will run also at elevated pressure usually because then we can raise the boiling point of our, of our solvents in the reactor, allowing to, to uh, boost the reaction even further. So touching on the techniques. So we mentioned that heat can't be directly measured. So we are actually measuring the secondary heat transfer. So first thing we need to mention is the difference between primary and a secondary heat transfer. So we have a three, uh, so the primary heat transfer is actually inside the reactor, inside the reacting mass. The secondary heat transfer is actually the, re uh, the reaction mass transferring its heat to its surrounding. So in case of this reaction colorimeter, it would be uh, transferring the heat from the vessel into the into the cooling jacket, and we would be determining the reaction power by the change of the temperature in the jacket and their difference. So there are three main techniques. It's a heat flow calorimetry, which was basically the one that Billy Reganas actually introduced. The true heat flow calorimetry, which is basically a very novel approach, which actually removes most of the disadvantages of a heat flow calorimetry, heat balance calorimetry, and power compensation calorimetry, which is a special case of the heat flow calorimetry. And we will usually run under isothermal or iso isoperibolic conditions to make sure that we can mimic the plant as close as possible. Since we have a limited time for this webinar, actually the technical talk about the methods, their pros and cons will be is planned for next webinar session, which will be hold, held in January. So please stay tuned. So what data can we actually obtain with a reaction color method? That's a quite uh, important question to be asked. So we will actually look into four really uh, most important ones, which is obviously the heat of reaction or the enthalpy change. So the definition is quite simple. It's amount of energy or heat released or absorbed by chemical reaction. So released, it's exothermic reaction, absorbed, it would be uh, uh, endothermic reaction. And it's actually quite simple because since we can't measure the, the enthalpy directly, we can actually only measure the change. So it's usually the final enthalpy minus the initial enthalpy. That's a very simple way to put it. For process development, the preferred way to report it is a sp in a specific heat of reaction, so in kilojoules per kilogram, because it's very easily scalable at a different uh, different scale of the reactors, because it will be same in a half liter reactor and same in a hundred liter reactor. 
There is a one quirk with most of the reaction calorimeters, though, because as I guess quite few know from thermodynamics, endothermic reactions have a positive sign and exothermic have a negative sign. Most of the commercially available calorimeters will actually report it the other way around, which is a bit counterintuitive. But it actually makes sense in a way, because calorimeters will report all effects that actually lead to temperature increase, meaning exothermic effects as a positive. And uh, we can actually calculate the, the enthalpy change quite easily, theoretically, from enthalpies of formation, if we know our process really well. However, it's always advisable to measure the heat of reaction under realistic conditions to basically confirm the calculations. Another important thing is heat capacity, so amount of energy needed to raise the reaction mixture temperature by one Kelvin. This is actually quite easily measurable during the initial screening test by DSC, but the heat, uh, but the reaction calorimeters will give us uh, will give us the possibility to actually measure it continuously. So the specific heat capacity, again, kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin is very widely used because we can use it uh, and it's directly scalable. And it actually allows us to calculate vital safety parameters, which one of the most vital one is adiabatic temperature rise, which we talk about now. So it's a thing about temperature rise when conditions change to adiabatic. So what happens if the conditions change to adiabatic? So as I mentioned, as I mentioned it with the adiabatic calorimeters, basically most of the heat that is released by the reaction will be contained inside, resulting in a temperature increase. Typical example where the typical re reactor can enter this kind of a mode is where the cooling failure occurs. And it's calculated from a specific heat of reaction and specific heat capacity of the reaction mixture. And it's a, one of the major indicators about the criticality of the process. We'll touch on that a little bit later. And the last a very important one is reaction accumulation. Because we, in percent, we can actually give us instantaneous percentage of non converted reactants. So we have a two scenarios, fast and slow reactions. Uh, so fast reactions are usually very desirable because for example, if we do some region inside of our reactor, it would immediately react and we have an immediate response from the reacting systems. So we can actually control the rate of heating by limiting the feed rate of the region. But that's unfortunately not always the case because if we encounter slow reactions uh, and we add too fast, we will actually have unreacted regions inside of the vessel. We literally have no control. We can't really do anything while, while, while it's inside. So there could be even a situation that uh, the kinetics are such that we actually have to add quite a lot of region before our reaction takes place. And the rule of thumb that processes with high level of accumulation can be very hazardous, can be are very ha more, more hazardous and because even if we actually stop the dosing, we have a still quite a lot of unreacted regions which will still release the heat, which can lead to potential thermal runaway. So to understand a little bit more, I have this small diagram. So uh, if you look at it, there uh, are three lines. So uh, the black one is a dosed amount. So you can see, uh, and if we talk about the fast reaction first, on the onset of dosing, we have a, we have a reaction power increasing. And as we stop it, it will decline quite fast back to the baseline. With a slow reaction, you can see when we stop the feed, it's basically just about when the reaction power reaches maximum. And even if we stop the feed, it will take a long time uh, for the reaction to actually work off, uh, work off back to the baseline because we have a large amount of reactants present inside the, inside the reactors. We can't literally do anything about unless we use some quenching technique. So what are the other things that we can actually read from the reaction calorimetry. Obviously, there are a lot more we can do, but these are really the basic ones. So as a power output, we can actually describe physical characteristics and their changes, for example, crystallizations. We can actually uh, measure gas generation in our process if it's needed. And we can actually uh, check the species formation as well. So what can we actually get? So we can actually make decisions to make sure our process is safe. So for example, we can make sure that even during the cooling failure, the boiling conditions wouldn't be reached if it's undesirable, which usually is, unless it's a reflux process. Uh, 
and we can actually make sure that the secondary reaction or the composition, the thermal runaway temperature isn't actually reached even uh, during uh, failure scenarios. It will give us a power output so we can actually calculate the cooling power needed to run our plant safely and prepare for construction of a such and give us accumulation data so we can actually optimize the dosing feeds to keep the reaction under control under all, uh, all uh, circumstances. And we can quite easily also evaluate the use of catalysts and different types of catalysts. So the main message is the efficiency of the process can be fine-tuned very effectively using the reaction colorimetry data, even for the processes which have been running for years without a problem. But that is not all because the advances in technology and sensors allows us uh, methods to be implemented straight to the reaction colorimeters. So we can actually have a in, uh, in situ uh, analytics, so we can have IR probes monitoring, monitoring our, our regions. We can have Raman spectroscopy. We can, if we have, a, for example, uh, crystallization uh, process, we can uh, monitor particle sizing and its distribution. We can monitor pH and control. We can have a real-time sampling using auto samplers, or we can even have an online GCMS analysis of headspace gases if they are being generated. And on a picture, you can actually see a thermogram from reaction colorimeter, actually this one, uh, which was acetic anhydride. And you can see that the purple line is the actual entropy of the process, whereas the blue and the red curves are the signals from a IR spectro spectrometer, which basically confirms uh, the conversion of the reactants in the, in the reactor. So that was basically the desired reactions. So what will happen if you have a process deviations? So uh, the green one is basic, the green line is basically what typical process would be. So we heat up to the process temperature, everything is running. When we're done, it will decline back. We have our product. So what happens, for example, if you have a cooling, cooling failure? Then the yellow line actually takes place because we will enter adiabatic conditions. So all the reaction is still going, temperature will increase even further. It's called a deviation temperature. But in a case that our process actually has, a, has been poorly designed or the, the composition reaction actually is very close to the process temperature, we can reach the thermal runaway, which will result usually in a reactor failure. So the typical thing to be uh, done really with the process is the criticality assessment. So we can actually quantify any process in a one of the five groups, uh, de uh, depending really on a four major indicators. And there are very extensive guidelines how to actually, if you find out that the pro your process, for example, is criticality uh, hazard four, how to actually make sure to move it back because criticality steps one and two are usually considered safe. So we need four values to actually do the proper, proper quantification in this case. So we need to know the decomposition temperature or its onset, which is the orange field on the diagram on the right. We need to know the boiling point of our reaction mixture, which is the blue point. We need to know the process temperature, so the temperature our process is designed to run. And we need to do the maximum temperature of the synthesis reaction, which is uh, the which is the process temperature we're running at and the temperature of the adiabatic rise if the cooling would fail. And depending on how those values are actually organized, we can actually see how critical our, our process is. So there's a lot of literature on the internet from different societies. I don't really want to go into too much detail because it's probably a material for another two or three webinars. So potential process deviations, so I just listed some of them, obviously, the most uh, frequent one is the last one, is the system failures or the human factor error. But what can be the human factor? We can have wrong reactants put into the, the vessel. We can, if you have a multiple regions, wrong dosing order, uh, we can actually start addition at the wrong temperature. We actually have a wrong flow rate of the reactions, which can all lead to potentially, uh, uh, to potentially dangerous situations. So those are the things we can actually identify and simulate using the reaction colorimetry or combination in, or in conjunction with the adiabatic colorimetry. So we are now uh, reaching the place when we will look at the examples. So I have uh, two examples, which were reduction using solid metal hydrides. And 
just a simple fact, semi-batch process, heterogeneous reaction. So we have a reaction mixture and we add our reducing agent inside of the, of the vessel. So we basically are agitating a slurry while the reduction is taking place. So the, the temperature of the process is critical in this phase because it will initiate the reduction. So if the temperature is too low and we add the reducing agent, we have a high amount of accumulation because it will take some time before the redu re uh, reduction starts and the process keeps running. So as this process was designed, no deviations were actually found during the process development, even with the, with the reaction calorimeters. So they proceeded to scale up on 200 reactors and thermal runaway has actually occurred. So the obvious question will be why, because it didn't show earlier. So they actually used the data from the scale up reactor, simulated the runaway with the information from 100 liter reactor, and they found a simple fix. Just raise the reaction mixture temperature by 10 degrees, because with a higher temperature, if you add the re reducing agent, the, re uh, the re reaction is uh, initiated immediately, so which led to very, very lower levels of accumulation of the hydride inside of the reactor, keeping the batch temperature at acceptable levels and controllable levels. So the conclusion from this example is very simple. You can use the reaction color method to understand and redesign, even if something goes wrong during the scale up. The second example is a reducing agent, uh, again, a little bit different situation though. So again, heterogeneous reaction, solid addition of the, uh, of the reagent. And they actually ran the process very, very uh, successfully for 20 times in a pilot lab on a bigger scale. So they actually decided, all right, it's perfect. We'll proceed to another step in our, in our, in our production, which was quenching the sample with the aqueous sulfuric acid. And as they did it, the plant was immediately filled with a smell of rotten X after quenching. So what could go wrong? What did went wrong? So after they cleaned up the lab, they actually found out that the agitator in the reactor had corroded off and fell off the shaft. But since the shaft was still rotating, it still indicated the correct speed. The lack of string led to the high level of uh, accumulation of the reducing agent. So, uh, so it didn't react altogether as they were used to. So after adding the quenching uh, reagent, the accumulated reactant actually reduced the water from the aqueous solution of the sulfuric acid uh, to hydrogen gas that subsequently reacted with the sulfuric acid forming hydrogen sulfide resulting in the smell inside of a plant. So they actually took the, this experiment to reaction calorimeter and they confirmed that the reduction of water with the forming of uh, hydrogen sulfide is a preferred path. So they for their process development, they needed to make sure, and it's essential to make sure all of the reducing agent is actually converted before proceeding to the quenching step. So just to a uh, few conclusions. So is it really necessary to do the calorimetric studies? Oh, yes, reaction calorimetric can provide all the data you could possibly need to understand the reaction you're trying to perform. And if you have a multi-step process, you should really pay a lot of attention to every step that you're not really sure how it will go and how it will behave. You can actually simulate the what-if scenarios, and if you have some problems, you can actually recreate them, and it will give you the provisions to understand what went wrong. And basically, the real message is scaling up without knowledge of the thermochemistry of your process can lead to potentially hazardous situations. And there was quite a lot historically uh, and even quite recent incidents reporting reported because of a lack of understanding of the thermochemical parameters of the process. So I know we overrun a little. So uh, let's do the summary. So we covered the basics of the process development and the, safe, uh, and the process safety fundamentals. We have looked at different types of calorimeters and the difficulties and challenges of heat measurements. We looked in a very, very introductory way on the reaction calorimetry, its first principles and overview. And we have looked at examples, how it can be actually used to understand the process better. So as we mentioned, it's really introduction. Uh, we plan to go a lot more technical 
in the next webinar, which basically will focus on the reaction calorimetry and the different techniques, as I mentioned, the heat flow calorimetry, uh, the true heat flow calorimetry, and the heat balance calorimetry more in detail, explaining all the pros and cons of such. So we are reaching the question time. So I would, I would like to ask you, please ask your questions on your go to webinar uh, screen. There is a question step please submit them and we will try to answer some of them. But don't worry, we will actually answer all the questions, even those we actually can't do uh, here live. So I'll leave, let you have one or two minutes to actually submit your questions. Okay, so we have some questions coming in. So I'll ask my colleague to actually read them for me. Okay, so the first question, what types of calorimeters are used for typical safety studies? Okay, so let me repeat it because my colleague doesn't have a microphone. So what kind of color meters will be used for safety studies? So usually you need a combination of the screening method and the reaction color meter. So, but usually uh, all three methods, the micro color meters for the initial screening, the adiabatic color meters for the failure mode scenarios and the reaction color meters to optimize and understand your desirable reactions will be used but usually you need some combination of the two to give you a perfect understanding of your process. Okay. Uh, someone's commented that they've noticed reaction calorimeters usually have quite small vessels. Why is that? Uh, I actually mentioned it. Uh, so, uh, sorry. So we have a question, why are the reaction calorimeter have usually smaller vessels? I actually mentioned that before, because on a smaller scale, we can actually deliver deliver easily a lot more cooling power. So we are actually able to control the exotherms on a small scale a lot, lot more easily than, let's say, in 20 or 50 liter reactors, where we would need a lot bigger cooling power to actually keep the conditions under control. So that's, that's the reason. Usually the smaller scale, the better. Also depends on the sensitivity of the, of the methods. There's a lot more, and we will actually touch it in the next webinar. Another one, uh, you mentioned that reaction calorimetry can be conducted in liquid medium only. What about crystallization reactions where a solid phase is formed? What, can, what information can reaction calorimetry provide about crystallization in these conditions? Okay, so there's a question about, uh, because we mentioned it's possible, to, well, it's desirable to do the calorimetry in a liquid media and is it possible to do calorimetry, uh, crystal, uh, crystallization studies? It's very well possible. It really depends because even crystallization is a thermal event because we need energy to form the crystals. So it really depends how sensitive uh, your device is. So there are calorimeters, reaction calorimeters, which are very sensitive and actually aren't affected by the, by the phase change inside them. So you're actually quite easily able to quantify the energy needed for for actual forming of the crystals. And as I, as I mentioned, you can actually combine it with the methods as, such as FBRM to actually measure the particle size distribution and, uh, and their shape really in online as your reaction is happening. So I believe that's the simple, simple answer. And another question, um, are there any industries where calorimetry is valued more than others? Well, uh, so are there any industries where calorimetry is more valuable than the others? Uh, well, uh, really the, the major application is the process safety and chemical plants. Really, that's by, by far the most used, uh, most used uh, place, really, because that was originally why the reaction calorimeters themselves were really used. But I know uh, it's a very uh, important thing, for example, even in biology, for example, you would use the DSC, the microcalorimeters, to actually uh, understand the mechanics, for example, of protein crystallizations and they are, oh, I forget the word, and basically they are breaking down with heat. So actually they have a quite wide biology, uh, biology uh, applications. And if, the, if your system is actually sensitive enough, you can actually do uh, calorimetry studies even in a kind of a bioreactors to, to actually understand the biological processes as well. It all comes down to techn technique used and the sensitivity of your, of your system. 
So, uh, so if we have more questions, we will actually answer them uh, privately in an email. Uh, one more thing. Uh, I know that we didn't really mention our offering, but if you're interested, because this was more on the educational side in our products, please check our website. You'll find a lot of information about our offering in reaction colorimetry, and we are here to help you. So I would like to thank you for your attention and for your time. And one more thing, uh, after we actually uh, stop the broadcast, a survey will pop, pop in uh, on your screen. If you could spend one or two minutes filling in, it would be very helpful to get a feedback. How did you like, what did you didn't like, uh, and uh, to help us improve in the future webinars. So thank you again for your attention. We are serious. We are making more chemistry possible.